welcome to a bit of everything. My special guest this week is arts leader and strategist Tony Grabowski. A former CEO of the Australia Council, Tony has led and managed several major arts organisations in Melbourne and Sydney. He's worked with politicians, bureaucrats, artistic directors and an eclectic group of creative performers across a broad spectrum of Australian society. Over the last three years, he's developed his own strategic consultancy, assisting the arts community deliver improved commercial outcomes for their endeavours. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Tony, I guess one of the first areas I'd like to explore with you is how do you see the current state of the arts community following COVID? Um, where, where, where is the arts community up to? Yeah, it's a good question. The, uh, they've taken it pretty tough, I, I have to say, at every level. You know, individual artists, um, you, you know, small to medium companies, the major companies. Uh, I think there wouldn't be one arts organisation in the country or one artist that hasn't been impacted in some way. If you just think of the life of musicians, particularly in, um, particularly in Melbourne, very big music scene, lots of small venues, yeah. pubs, things like that, all gone. Over a, over a, over a two-year period, um, the big companies um, just had to had to stop essentially for you know, 12, 18 months, and then getting back was getting back was very slow. Uh, so it's um, so it has been really tough, and I think. So is it, is it a work in progress, or do you think that some organisations just it's the end? <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it was such a dramatic time. And it must have been very, very difficult to keep things going. Like we saw Circus Oz, for example. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's. I think they. Um, there wouldn't be one organisation that hasn't had to really relook at its strategy and what its role and purpose is. Uh, we're coming back now, and yep. there's still incredible uncertainty, sort of out there. I mean, audiences that the, the routine of audiences has been completely disrupted. disrupted yeah. you know, so the traditional audience. But I'm seeing some examples of, you know, people are doing really well, back pre-COVID levels, others, others not so well. Uh, and there's been some organisations, Melbourne Festival or the Rising Festival as it's now called, has had, you know, incredible bad luck last year. They opened, uh, everything was planned, three week festival, they opened, did one day and then, and then it was the, it was the shut down the next day. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I suppose one thing that uh, it's demonstrated the resilience of the sector. I think the commitment of boards who've uh, really had to really? had to sort of put in and support. I mean, most boards were meeting 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 monthly. Um, so we're only coming out the other side, um, and really the next 12, 12 18 months uh, okay. will um, will we'll be really critical to to recoup recoup some of those losses. Um, there has been a couple of positive things and things, some, some learnings from that. Uh, you know, you're, and you'll see in contemporary music or um, you know some of the things in the media, some artists have used that period mm. as creative development. Yes. So we're now seeing some special work. And we saw some, Zoom meetings of, of, of various uh, ensembles and, and various yeah. different technology. What do you think the main challenges the sector faces? For many organisations, oh, you know, the, the Australian Dance Theatre is, is one is one example. Oh, a number of small to medium companies, um, you know, Circa, the physical theatre company, it's, they tour for tour internationally for three, four, five, six months a year. So all gone. Yeah. So they've had to, and I suppose some of the companies or most of the companies have been quite fortunate with some of the government uh, government support mechanisms. Um, you know, job keeper. I think was that many benefited for that. Mm. The larger organisations that were statutory authorities support for, support from the government. So it's, I think, all governments, sort of state and federal government, should be, you know, I think quite applauded for. Um, so they, for, did, they for, did come through. The, they did come because through. With so many competing needs for budget dollars, is it harder or easier to maintain funding for the creative arts? And I guess one of the things that I'm been a bit unsure is. At what level is the federal government? Should they be doing more, or should the individual states be picking up the tab? The arts largely are, by, uh, you know, have bi bipartisan support, and there's m much evidence of that over over now many years at state state and federal level. 
Um, some research done last couple of years, uh, and it highlighted the fact that the arts are supported by three levels of government, and local government is a massive investor. The state governments have been really consistent, and then obviously the federal government with, with, with their mix. So it's it's a funding model that has has developed over time. Mm. It's quite quite collegiate, and uh, it used to be a uh, you know a co-ag committee, the the cultural ministers council. So all jurisdictions uh, <laughs> all jurisdictions would come together and share ideas, um, and it is there's some informal. Uh, I suppose, you know, some formal divides between them, and the federal government largely looks after things of national interest. All the national institutions, mm -hmm. the National Gallery, the National Museum, the National Library, uh, the two funding agencies, the Australia Council for the Arts and Screen, and Screen Australia. Uh, and so they're, they're largely looking after excellence at that, at that, national, yeah, that national at that national level. State government, uh, well, if you go to the counterpoint of that being uh, local government, Lots of local venues, local festivals, little funding programs. Um, you know, the nighttime economy in many, in mm. many, um, in many communities is, you know, we've seen the rise on that. And while it's been paused, I think that's that's certainly certainly coming back. Uh, and then the state government sort of fits in the middle. And really, the the state governments for many years have led the way in cultural policy development. Victoria, particularly. You know, in Creative State, um, what was it called? Um, you know, Creative Capacity Plus was one of the first, now about 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the first cultural policies. Um, now, I don't think there's one jurisdiction that doesn't have a clear articulated um, policy. Po policy in the arts, and mm -hmm. uh, many of them have gone towards the creative industries, mm -hmm. which is about employment. You work with a number of state governments in recent years. So mm -hmm. you probably had the, the opportunity to see that firsthand. But I, it's it's good to hear you say that it's yeah, no, no they, look they they genuinely are i think the the challenge comes and i don't think i've i've worked with many arts ministers at, at a state and federal level of, of both political mm. um, persuasion there's not one that isn't passionate about it you know from peter garrett to you know rod kemp down here you know many years ago george years brandes um, well, you know, Mitch Firefield, yes, it's a very interesting. <laughs> we'll, move, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that further. Um, but they're one voice in cabinet or in, or in the government, mm. and I think we can do what's beholden on us as community leaders in in the sector to help them with their argument about yeah. the value and impact. And I think if if I'm looking at sort of shifts over the last sort of five ten years. The broader community, governments, are realising that arts and culture are a big part about um, our livability, social cohesion, you know, telling our narratives, our story, our, our identities. And particularly post-COVID, uh, the local is important. We want to get together as communities in our local, um, you know, in, in, in our local area. So that's a massive, um, uh, I think governments are waking up to that. I think they realise that. But it's coming up with a really succinct argument so that treasurers and indeed prime ministers or premiers really are passionate about that. If you look at, back at some of the real sort of funding increases, um, they've always had the support of the prime minister. If you go back to Paul Keating, John Howard's period was absolutely, he's not really celebrated for this, but massive increases to the arts over, uh, you know, uh, over over his over his period, mm, probably something he doesn't. Uh, not many people sort of talk about that sort of those contributions. I guess as CEO of the Australia Council, you've had to balance a lot of competing influences and personalities. You've worked with a whole range of political operatives, including Simon Crean, George Brandis, uh, to name just a few. I'd be interested to understand to what degree. Um, both sides of politics really understand the challenges of the arts community in Australia because a lot of people, I guess, feel that they're just mainly giving away money. Simon was a, um, he was passionate about having a national cultural policy. And there had not been a national cultural policy for, um, I think, nearly 20 years. So he was, and he was also, um, uh, committed to reviewing the Australia Council. The Australia Council, now nearly 60 years old, it was established 
as an arm's length mechanism and agency to ensure that politics didn't influence the distribution of, of funding into, into the arts, that it was given to peers, that it was given to experts to, uh, to, um, to distribute. And uh, there hadn't been a major review done, so we pushed that. That was a significant, significant thing. Uh, and also the national cultural policy. Now, unfortunately, the, you know, politics, he, was, he delivered both those documents and then, um, that's, uh, yeah. uh, and then and Tony, Burke, t Tony Burke picked up the, uh, picked up the uh, you know, that challenge and uh, got both those things through. And then, of course, there was a change of government and, uh, and George Brandis then j j he, took he's over. He's been quite a polarising figure, George. Um, I recall reading in the papers that I think um, Australia had, was at the Venice Biennale and he had all the various people from probably including yourself all the arts leaders that were there and contributing, and then he came back to Australia, and before you knew it, the whole charter of the Australia Council seemed to get a bit of a, a bit of a mashup. Yeah, so for a relatively small agency and relatively small amounts of money, but massive for the arts, he he did a um, quite a a massive policy shift. Um, Which was a surprise. It was a, it was a complete surprise, as you say. I, I was with him in um, in Venice. They opened the um, the Australian Pavilion. Australia is one of only twenty eight countries that has a permanent pavilion in the you know in that amazing art art, art exhibition. Mm. Um, and and he created a massive um, massive change of uh, change of architecture of of arts funding. Uh, and he took a substantial, or he repositioned a substantial amount of funding, which was distributed through the Australia Council at arm's length, into a new program mm. controlled, by the, controlled by the government. Uh, and that created incredible um, uh, sector, ba sector backlash. Because it just came out of. Because yes. he'd sort of set up two structures. And, and it's it, completely, they were. Um, uh, 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 they were competing structures, if you like, and it was it was undermining the, the whole principle and the values of what that separation from government and having an agency and having a you know uh, 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 an agency that's distributing over um, over two hundred million um, in, into the in funding, um, in, in, in funding yeah. to the arts. So that led to the community backlash was was so strong. Uh, there was this, there was the Senate inquiry, uh, and so a Senate committee sort of travelled around the country and spoke to um, and, and, and spoke to everybody that the recommendations from that inquiry was to was to return was to return the funds um, which they were ultimately in part in part and then he then um, uh, uh, portfolios changed and then Mitch Fifield took over the uh, took over from him and he was very much a, a stabilizing and um, and, and it seemed of, a little bit more, less controversial, George. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, politicians in politicians in arts, I, I can I can sort of understand their perspective. They they finally get office and they finally have a portfolio that they um, that they particularly you know are passionate about. Peter Garrett is um, is probably one of the ministers I, re I recall. But they sit down and look at their budget, and it's you know just short of a billion dollars. Mm. But most of it is tied up, or the the majority of it is tied up, going to those institutions, and then to Screen Australia for distribution to support the screen sector, and then to, to the Australia mm. Council to support the um, uh, to support the the, the, the performing and, and visual arts and literature. Uh, and they have very little control. So what mm. levers can they you know yeah. can they press? So. That is what ministers of all persuasion have, have said to me. It's, a, it's about uh, wanting to have some influence or, um, or difference. How was Malcolm Turnbull? He was well, a, a major lover of the arts. Was he, did he get very involved? He didn't really. I mean, he didn't really get involved. Um, the, the, minister, the senior ministers that, that I can recall that really got involved was, was back over the Howard years. Okay. They would go and engage a lot. Yep. Uh, yep. From um, uh, I recall the and you know on one of um, um, uh, John Howard's visits to the UK, he the Australian Ballet was there and he went to the ballet. Now Julia Gillard also um, was actually quite you know she was actually quite good and, and quite good and supportive. It's 
uh, and it comes back to if there's strong support in cabinet, if there's if there's real depth and leadership at the end of the day, when all ministers are sitting there sort of trying to get it, you know additional funds for their for their portfolio, if the boss and the, if the boss and the banker uh, get it and understand the value that a relatively small amount of money is is going to make, then um, that's where we see some that's where we, where we see some shifts. One of the influential members of your board was Rupert Meyer when you were in Australia Council, and I know that uh, Rupert has long been a, a, a tremendous supporter of the arts. What, what influence did Rupert have on your career in that time at the Australia uh, Council? Because there seemed to be quite a few changes in the board structure. Yes, and um, so Rupert ultimately appointed me through the, you know, through, through, through the. Uh, th through the recruitment process, and you're absolutely right. Through that period, we were we would talk every day, you know, at least. He was, and I feel so privileged to have worked with uh, with such a deeply experienced um, leader and, and man. I mean, he's he chaired the the uh, National Gallery of uh, Ga Gallery of Australia. He sat on the, the National Gallery of Victoria board. I mean, endless endless senior appointments. He also sits on a number of corporate boards and has a you know, corporate and finance, finance background. But his wisdom and his insights and support of a CEO, uh, but also leading the culture of the organisation through the, through the board. Well, he's, a, he's a very experienced chairman. He must mm. have learned quite a bit from him. Uh, you know, he, I guess his, his frame of reference is probably as good as anyone in, in Australia in terms of both... A, commercial board level, but also not-for-profits and, and um, the arts organisations, so, yeah. Even in my work now, I sort of have a, have a, you know, when you're facing a particularly challenging situation or strategic problem, I sort of think, well, what would Rupert do? How would he, how would he break, how would he break that down? And um, that sort of logical thinking, uh, I think compassion, understanding for for, for both sides, but um, but being tough when you, when when he, he needed when, when he needed to be yeah. was um, and it was that uh, but it was that leadership and leadership of the culture because the culture of the we were going through organisational review obviously been amazing uh, and a uh, you know significant funding shift so the organisation was quite rattled but. Uh, with his support, I think we we managed through that. Really yeah. And one of the things that uh, you know we had a board meeting soon after that shift, and uh, you know we looked at our strategy, and which we just set, and actually uh, George Branderson and Julie Bishop sort of came to the launch at the Opera House. It was the first time in many years that that the that, that the federal mm. funding agency had had an articulated strategy. Um, that strategy remained true and was more important to ever, more important than ever. And we remained there as we, we, we um, you know, maintained that resolve. And um, and it was complex balance because there was that pressure from the sector to to, to jump up and down and, you know, and complain yeah. and get the money, yeah. you know, get the money back. Now our conversations were, uh, you know, as a government agency, uh, advocacy is a massive part of the job. But it's not on the front page of um, it's not on the front page of the, uh, of the papers. It's you know it's subtle and through through conversations and submissions and, and so forth with the with the government working hand in hand in lockstep with the sector, who um, who um, who really were you know obviously led the um, uh, you, you know led that campaign of um, of a response to that to that to that government policy. One of the things that I remember um, must have been quite a daunting um, thing for you was to appear in front of the Senate Estimates Committee on a number of occasions, which is, you know, seems to be to me just a trial by a group of people that don't really know a lot about the subject matter that they're doing. Um, tell us a little bit about your experiences with the Senate Estimates Committee. <laughs> well, I appeared over the. Um, I was chief executive for six years and I was in the senior executive role for, for six years prior to that and I supported the previous CEO at Senate Estimates. So I appeared um, at the table at Estimates um, you know, three times a year over that period, so 30 or 40, 30 or 40 times. It's a bizarre process. It's, it um, seems to me that you get a lot of people there that uh, don't know much about the subject matter. 
that have this propensity to ask um, quite polarising questions and controversial questions when they when they know they're not going to get a response. <laughs> yeah. you know, just it's it's become, in many situations it becomes political political games and the opposition or opposition members come and ask you know the current government and you sit next to the minister the minister appears and the secretary of the department and then agencies sort of come you know uh, agencies come through and we all sort of sit there and sort of go through i don't think the australia council was was not called once um, so the scrutiny we scrutiny we went through but i'm very proud of the fact that um, our um, our transparency, our funding processes, um, you know, budgeting the process, yeah. uh, the governance, and again, that goes back to um, was was really solid as, as it should be for a for an independent um, independent agency at arm's length, but with a very short arm. I, I have to say, it's only in the last four years that you've come back to live in Melbourne. Well, it must have been a big change after being in Sydney for over twenty five years. Were there any particular reasons that you that you made the change? There, I mean, I grew up and studied in Melbourne, so left when I was uh, moved to Sydney with a with a job for a major company up there, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. You know, when I was 22, 23, um, and came back 30 years late. Came back 30 years later. Um, I needed a. I wanted a different chapter. My family's down here, and. Uh, you know, mum's mum's still alive, and um, you know, I wasn't around when my, when my father passed away, and that 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 affected me. Um, so I wanted to have a more of a connection with, um, uh, you know, coming back to, to where I grew up and loved. Family, family. Yeah, so that was that, that was part of it. Um, Melbourne is a vibrant artistic culture, and I see great potential. It's very different to very different to Sydney, but. Um, I suppose I'd had the benefit of certainly my years at the Australia Council and in previous roles, I'd worked at a national level. So um, I'd had contact, travelled extensively right across that period and had uh, uh, you know, lots, of, lots of contacts and, and understanding of the, different, of the nuances in the different jurisdictions. So coming to Melbourne seemed, you know, I was at, in my early 50s for the next chapter of my career. Uh, seemed like the um, you know a, a good thing to do I'm now working with the consultancy I mean I've heard, had clients in ev you know nearly every jurisdiction mm. now so because of that national national perspective that um, that, that I had Tony I understand you're writing a book um, about the arts and I guess there are a few people that have done as many strategic studies um, but what, what's, how is the book going and, and what direction do you want it to take in terms of, a, is it a critical review of the arts or is it a more helpful review? I think reflect, certainly um, reflecting on the last few years, um, working as a consultant and working very closely with arts organisations, often going through change or, um, or some issues and, and reflecting also on my time at the Australia Council. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in, in governance and good governance. And I think the governance framework that's been, been established, I suppose well established for, for more than 20 years, and essentially is, um, was brought, brought in through um, um, a review undertaken by Dr. Helen Nugent. And her, her principle was if, if you have a good skills, uh, good skills mix on the board, you had a very clear strategy, uh, and you had good good corporate plans, then that would provide the foundation for the arts to flourish. Right. And because up until that time, a lot of organisations were facing, fa facing challenges and go running to, r running to the government for, uh, for bailouts and things like that. So her argument was it needed, you, know, you needed a very good governance structure and it was incredibly successful. But fast forward 20, you know, 20 years, now every small to medium company mm. has, you know, has a board and over time I think uh, and they're all voluntary positions there's very few very few paid uh, paid directors on, on companies yeah. corporate compliance has also gone through the roof really so the responsibility even for small organizations for these boards really is is significant and while very experienced people, who are used to being on boards from the corporate sector have, have gone on to not-for-profit, you know, arts boards. There seems to be a, um, 
Well, my view is there needs to be a new approach because there is a real challenge or, or a hesitance to, to understand how to govern when you're dealing with, a, w w w w uh, with an artistic product. Essentially, arts organisations create public good through, you know, mm. through art. So how you, measure that, how, you, how you measure that, and a lot of people feel, um, and it's not about making artistic assessment, but it's about making good strategy for an organisation so that the art can, you need to uh, can, 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 can flourish, sure. yes. So, uh, and there are literally thousands of people who volunteer every week, every month to, to, to sit on these boards because they want to make a difference and they want to bring their skills. Um, but my view is that they focus on, uh, simply on compliance, you know, the, the requirements of being a, uh, of being a corporate director. And they're a bit unsure about strategies because it because it, it fits in with the art, because it you know blurs into the art, uh, and there's also a massive advocacy role, which I think is um, goes back to our, our discussion about advocating about the value, the impact, uh, to anybody who's an investor, either a, a philanthropist, a, you know, a ticket buyer, or, or even government. So, so my book is is arguing, um, and again I'm writing it in partnership with. Uh, with a very distinguished academic who's um, been looking at arts governance for, for many years. But we're trying to look at a, a new approach. Right, you know, exactly. To make it very practical mm. and to try and, I suppose, optimise the incredible input that uh, the directors are doing, but just to give them some, some tips and some structure to, um, uh, to really ensure that their organisation is um, is, is, is optimised in all the all, all the inputs. So um, yeah, it, it's a big it's a big project, and um, hopefully we'll finish we'll it. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a best. I don't think it's going to be a bestseller. No, sure, <laughs> yes. You've achieved a lot in your career. What future? Ma what mountains have you got still to climb? In, in many of a terrific career in the arts, all the arts organisations. Um, and certainly working at, you know, briefly for the state government down here, but then for the Australian Council, you get an amazing bird's eye view of, of what's happening in the sector. It's a great privilege to, to get to know the, all the art forms, how government policy works, how strategy works at a, you know, at a, at a government level, and you see the challenges which, uh, w w which everybody from individual artists through to, through to companies face. The next 10 years of my life and the reason for starting up this consultancy was to really use that knowledge and insight in, and to help be it individuals, uh, and I do quite a bit of executive executive coaching and uh, people in the arts and help people with their with their very senior um, um, you know interview processes through strategy and planning and reviews for organisations who really want to um, to look at what's to to, to, yeah. to lift and what's changed to optimise that, that that performance. Um, but also, when, an, when something does go wrong and an organisation does get in, into a bit of trouble for whatever reason, I suppose, and I've got a team of, um, of associates, some, some of the best people who've had direct industry experience, uh, we go in and help triage. And, and, and so I suppose making a, making a difference because, uh, you know, I really appreciate the, you know, the passion of which people are committed to you know, working in arts and arts and cultural sector, often for modest salaries. The volunteer boards are only there to, you know, to make a difference. Mm. So if I can bring my expertise to make to help the them, unwrap, a bit to, to make it a little bit easier, that's yeah. that's my objective. Are there any disappointments and regrets that you look back on now and say, well, maybe I should have done that, or I wish I did more with that? Mm. That's a. Um, I probably over my time at the Australia Council, I would have I would have spent a little bit a little bit more time with the boards of the uh, boards of the organisations. Um, you know, council had a had a had a policy to say, well, we'll provide you with the funding, but it's independent. It, it, you know, it's it's independent. So your board is absolutely sort of responsible for the leadership of those organisations. But but I think there could have been some further further conversations to really support them in the understanding of how it all, you know, how it all works yeah, from, a, from a government perspective. And just asking some really simple questions like, you know, what, as a small dance company or, or a, you know, a literature festival or, you know, whatever, yes. 
what is your role in the what is your role in the ecology and the arts ecology? Who are your stakeholders, and what are you trying to achieve? So very simple, very simple questions, and often boards get get lost in the lost in the de lost in the detail. And I think so. Um, so that's probably what I what I would have would have done more. Tony, we'd like to finish with the top ten. This is an attempt to, I guess, better understand some of your personal likes. Um, so I'm going to throw out a, um, a question and I'd ask you to respond as quickly as you can. Favourite city in the world? Well, it'll have to be New York. Yeah. Favourite movie? Not a, big, not, not a big movie attendee, however, over COVID, um, discovered Netflix and now a bit of a, bit, bit of a, um, bit, bit of a Netflix. Yeah, yes. Favourite holiday destination? Uh, South America. Favourite restaurant? Well, I, this is only a, a, a restaurant. It's more a gastro pub, I suppose. Um, um, I was walking down uh, Royal Parade in Norton's Hotel, which was the sticky carpet sort of student pub right across the road from the conservatorium where, where I studied at Uni in Melbourne, has now been completely beautifully renovated and is a, is a friendly, uh, a stylish... Life. Yes, so Norton's Hotel on, um, uh, in Melbourne, Parkville. Football team, the follow football. Well, 30 years in Sydney, of course, it would have to be the Sydney Swans. Um, but, of course, now moving to Melbourne, I, I, you, you couldn't miss the, the extraordinary win of Melbourne. Favourite food? Favourite food. I suppose being in a place where, where the chef has some narrative or connection with, with the produce, uh, regardless of the thing. If they're passionate about the produce they're using, um, then tends to be, um, that's what tend to really enjoy. Favourite wine? Favourite wine is Heathcote Shiraz. Shiraz, good. Favourite music? Is there a genre of music that you like? Well, I grew up on orchestral music and then, um, but really it's as diverse. Um, it's, it's very diverse and I listen to, um, listen to most things. It's, it, it's hard to keep up these days, I have to say, but Australia is, a, is an absolute you know, leader in contemporary music. I mean, more, more people around the world listen to Australian music now than, than ever. Than, than ever. It's, um, it's such an amazing art form for us. What car do you drive? I'm looking forward to having an electric car. I've, I've been in the Tesla. It was actually an Uber drive, and I, I'm, um, you know, yeah. being um, ready to uh, bolt you know, <laughs> to plug in and, and get going. And finally, how do you keep fit? Well, that's as you, as you get older, it's uh, it, it becomes a you know an uphill uphill battle. I've I've always um, maintained a gym regime through through my thirty years up in up in Sydney. Um, COVID was was tough, um, you know. I'm doing the uh, doing the extensive walks, but now back at the um, ba back at the gym. I, think I actually followed you on Instagram. You know, oh yes, doing 100 walks in Melbourne. <laughs> well, I started to sort of to, you know to uh, to have some interest. I'd start to shoot. Uh, well, I set a destination to places I haven't been, and um, there, it didn't quite get to 100, but. Um, but I certainly visited some interesting, uh, interesting places, and it just had developed quite a following, uh, following on that. Um, but I think of, I think of exercise, especially as you get into your fifties, is, is a bit like superannuation. You've got to, you've got to put it away every day because otherwise you'll, <laughs> you don't use, it. You know, you'll come back. It'll come back to bite you. Well, I'd like to thank you, Tony, for making your time available today for a bit of everything. Um, I think. You have shown uh, some incredible insights into the arts in Australia today. And um, a bit of everything is, is really an attempt by us, I, I guess, to get to know some of our business leaders in a little bit more detail and their attitudes on all sorts of subjects. So I hope our viewers have found uh, the discussion interesting and uh, we look forward to introducing you to a number of other prominent business leaders in the months ahead. Thank you.